Britain's royal palaces. Majestic. It's absolutely dripping in history. Luxurious. The white drawing room at Buckingham Palace is like a scene from a Disney film. And packed to the rafters with incredible secrets. Secrets that the royal family would much prefer not to be made public. From royal courtships to royal births to royal marriages and scandals, the palaces have played host to all of that. This series goes behind palace walls. The royal palaces represent the monarchy and have incredible history. We'll learn how these iconic creations were built. 16th century kings built with brick in a way that we wouldn't recognize today. This is George IV leaving his mark on the center of London. Uncover the spectacular palace art housed within. The royal collection is vast and I mean vast. It has more than a million objects spread across all of the royal palaces. Just imagine what has been collected over centuries. So this collection is unlike any other collection in the world. Discover their gruesome stories. It's an amazing insight into the royal's history, but also our common history. Frankly, we're going to cut the head off a king. It's got to be done in a palace and relive the recent events that shaped the modern royal family. The whole case was an absolute fiasco and a huge embarrassment. The Queen was particularly aggrieved that Harry had done it in the way that he had. This is The Secrets of the Royal Palaces. This time, a palace security breach puts the Queen in peril. To wake up to find a complete stranger standing over your bedside must be terrifying. We reveal Sandringham's scandalous past as a playboy prince creates the ultimate party palace. He was a gambler, he was a bit of a drinker, and he was constantly at it. And the world's most iconic palace suffers a plumbing problem. She had this handkerchief covered in perfume just put to her nose so she wouldn't smell it we reveal the secrets of leonardo da vinci's drawings hidden within the royal collection can you imagine the changes in the course of modern science that might have come about had we discovered them earlier and we glimpse inside windsor's coronavirus bubble like everybody the queen has had to make sacrifices during lockdown like the monarchs who have gone before her the queen has a range of spectacular palaces to enjoy she doesn't visit them on a whim. The royal year runs like clockwork. The Queen's calendar doesn't change. Every summer is at Balmoral and every Easter is always spent at Windsor. And for Christmas, there can only be one location, Sandringham in Norfolk. We think of Sandringham as all the royals getting together for their Christmas Day service and getting those iconic shots. This century, monarchs had spent the festive season at Windsor Castle. But this changed when the royals put down roots at this much-loved family home. Set in 20,000 acres of Norfolk countryside, this mini kingdom has been the private home of four generations of British monarchs. Sandringham's not an obvious regal property. It's often criticized for just being a country house and not a necessarily very distinguished one either. But the point of it is that it is comfortable. I think Sandringham occupies a unique position among the royal residences and each succeeding generation of royals has loved it. Sandringham is about the private person, it's about the family life behind the image of the throne. Prince Philip has retired there, so in many ways a kind of wholesome royal family house, but indeed its history was rather different. In 1862, Queen Victoria acquired the Sandringham estate for her somewhat wayward son and heir, Edward. Edward was notorious. As much as his parents were sort of chintzy and conservative and domestic and dull, Edward was revolting, libidinous. He was a gambler, he was a bit of a drinker, and he was constantly at it. He had a voracious appetite for women. Marlborough House, Edward's London home, was notorious. Sandringham would be a sobering retreat where he could grow into the role of king. Get him back on track, stick him in an off-path, off-beat estate, and see if we can't improve his behaviour somewhat. Edward threw himself into the project, demolishing the original Georgian house to make way for a new retro house. Sandringham was a style which some people call Jacobethan. It's a generic 16th into 17th century revival. It talks about an age of historical confidence, it's youthful, it's a bit extravagant, um, but by no means too extravagant. The new 
Sandringham looked sensible on the outside, but inside it was a palatial party house. You wonder what the architect's brief was for Sandringham. If you have a checklist for the racy young monarch to be of the 1860s and 70s, you might want a bowling alley or billiard tables. But you've got to have the space to entertain people and to get engaged in country pursuits. And if you are a Prince of Wales, you've got to do it in style. Edward also made the most of Sandringham's vast estate, turning it into a shooting paradise, complete with Europe's largest game larder. It was less in many respects about the house and more about the grounds, this kind of playboy park, for want of a better expression, which is where a lot of Edward's attention went. They planted thickets and they imported literally bags of the very best shoot in England. And that really, really mattered at the time. They say time waits for no man, but at Sandringham, even the clocks were subject to royal whims. Edward was absolutely determined to try and cramming as much hunting each day as he could. And indeed, he changed the clocks to create Sandringham time to give him more daylight hours to hunt in. Sandringham time, 30 minutes ahead of Greenwich Mean Time, was the official time on the estate from 1901 until 1936. And eventually, Edward's mother got her wish, as he and his country house settled down somewhat. The thing about Sandringham is that, like its inhabitants, it grew up. It went from being a place of billiards and bowling to more cultured pursuits as Edward VII and Queen Alexandra and their children all evolved and grew up. And so the old bowling alley became the long library and that's where the Queen is shown when she gave her first televised address to the nation. So it's not a fixed thing, it shows a life lived. The royal palaces serve as homes, as offices, and as bolt holes away from it all. But they all share a common purpose, to keep the royal family safe. Some were built with security in mind. Windsor is a castle. It was built to do battle. It was built to house armies. It was built to protect a royal family. But the palaces are not always as secure as they seem. At 6.45 a.m. on the 9th of July, 1982, unemployed labourer Michael Fagan approached Buckingham Palace. His actions over the next 45 minutes would uncover a series of shocking weaknesses in the palace's security systems. He managed to climb this 14-foot high wall. And then he climbed up a drain pipe into a window and found himself roaming free in the corridors of Buckingham Palace. It's the most extraordinary breach of security. For 15 minutes, Fagan wandered around the palace. A cleaner said good morning. I think he sat on the throne. He had taken his shoes off and had no socks. So he must have looked quite a sight. But clearly, um, nobody took any notice. Exactly how had Fagan evaded palace security? Apparently an alarm sensor had detected his movements, but police dismissed it. The officers in that control room had been desensitised to the alarms because there was ongoing problems by them giving false reasons. And no one would have known. But his early morning jaunt didn't end there. He entered a room that would turn his trespass into a worldwide scandal. At 7.15am, he found the door to the Queen's bedroom unprotected. Her security detail had gone off the night duty at 6 o'clock and nobody else was in place. And the next line of defence, her footman, was nowhere to be seen. The footman had taken the dog for a walk, so the Queen was there on her own. Inside the bedroom, Fagan opened the curtains and woke the Queen. The sight of this slightly dishevelled man wandering into her bedroom must have been really, really terrifying for the Queen. <laughs> to wake up to find a complete stranger standing over your bedside must be terrifying. The Queen pressed the alarm bell in her bedroom. But no one came. The Queen was incredibly composed. She kept Fagan talking. She remained incredibly calm. The Queen clearly got the measure of Michael Fagan, uh, engaged him in conversation. In fact, Fagan asked for some cigarettes. Luckily, a maid who'd been cleaning nearby entered the Queen's bedroom. The maid went to get cigarettes and returned 
police officers. Fagan was marched out of the palace, with everyone realising the Queen had been very lucky. It was a complete and utter disaster from a protection point of view. I mean, by very good luck, Michael Fagan did not go there with the intention of harming the Queen. But it could have turned out really badly. The impact of this break-in went much further than the Queen's bedroom. The commander of A Division was forced to resign and several other junior officers were actually disciplined um, and, and as a consequence. Changes to palace security were made with more armed police officers and upgraded security systems. And it seemed to do the trick. Buckingham Palace remained watertight for 20 years. But in 2003, Titan security was breached to an even more terrifying degree when an undercover journalist revealed how easy it was to get to the very heart of the royal palace. He even served the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh their breakfast. Coming up in Secrets of the Royal Palaces, we learn how a king lost his head in front of his palace. One moment you're decorating your palace, next moment you're executed outside it. And we uncover the groundbreaking Leonardo da Vinci drawings that lay hidden inside Windsor Castle. For about 250 years, these discoveries lay secret, hiding in the royal collection. Royal joy and celebration. But they have also been the site of the royal's darkest days. In January 1649, the monarchy was in peril, and so was King Charles I. He'd lost the English Civil War against Oliver Cromwell and his parliamentarians, and now he was on trial. He was essentially put on trial for not doing the job of king in the way he should have done, for really taking too many powers from Parliament and proroguing Parliament too much, so don't do that. He defended himself quite valiantly and said he shouldn't be on trial at all because he was king and only answerable to him up there. But it was a foregone conclusion, open and shut case to the Cromwellians. He was found guilty and sentenced to be executed. Having been tried at the Palace of Westminster, the king was sent to St. James's Palace to await his death. He had a lot of palaces to look at when he was suffering his final awful days. On the 30th of January, 1649, Charles was marched across St. James's Park, not to Tower Hill, the traditional execution site, but to the Palace of Whitehall. Because frankly, if you're going to cut the head off a king, it's got to be done in a palace. And this wasn't just any palace. Whitehall was probably the largest palace in Europe and the center of English royal power. It was also beautiful. At the Banqueting House of Whitehall, Charles I actually decorated the roof with these incredible Rubens paintings. As he's going to be executed for being too divine right, too power hungry as a king, he sees over his head these murals, these beautiful paintings of kingly divine right. Charles I is taken outside Whitehall Palace, that's for the Banqueting House, on a scaffold. He gives a very brave and valiant speech, but unfortunately, it's a bit windy and no one really can hear it. But he submits very bravely, he tucks his hair into a cap so that they can get a nice clean blade, and he raises his arm as a signal. So, you know, that's quite significant, isn't it, that actually he gets to raise his arm. Most people who are executed have no choice when the axe comes down, but he has that moment of grace. And he was finally executed in front of everyone outside Whitehall Palace. So you have to watch out if you're a king. One moment you're decorating your palace, next moment you're executed outside it. Charles I lost his throne and his head, but he left an incredible legacy, a collection of artworks that will become the basis of the royal collection. Charles I was a great lover of the arts. He recognized the power of collecting, the power of art to showcase the strength of the monarchy and of the court. When the monarchy was restored, the collection can boasting over one million items. Some are proudly displayed on palace walls, and others are carefully archived and rarely seen. Windsor Castle's print room is home to an extraordinary collection of some 600 drawings by Leonardo da Vinci. Leonardo da Vinci has rightly been recognized as one of the most 
incredible minds of all time. This collection was acquired by Charles II, who came to the throne nearly 150 years after Leonardo's death. Both men shared a passion for the arts and science. Charles II was known as the Merry Monarch. He had spent years in exile after the beheading of his father, Charles I. And when he came back, he was absolutely determined to invest in the arts and in the sciences. That was going to be his legacy. He founded the Royal Observatory. He sponsored the Royal Society, which was the oldest scientific institute anywhere in the world. For hundreds of years, this collection of drawings has been kept hidden at Windsor, where only a privileged few could view them, including a young Prince Charles. As a boy, Prince Charles was rather taken by these drawings and spent some time with archivists looking at them. And when he later told the family what he'd been doing, they thought it was all rather strange because, of course, they'd all been outside messing around on horses um, and he had been locked inside looking at the drawings of da Vinci. In 2019, the public were allowed a glimpse of this rare collection, as hundreds of them went on display at Buckingham Palace's Queen's Gallery. 2019 was a mesmerising moment. They'd always been lent in small numbers to individual exhibitions, but there was a huge exhibition at the Queen's Gallery. Actually, these drawings were never intended to be seen at all. Leonardo used them as his laboratory to explore new ideas, particularly in the field of human anatomy. The things he discovered were revolutionary, really minute anatomical drawings that can still help anatomists today. For about 250 years, these discoveries lay secret, hiding in the Royal Collection. But can you imagine the changes in the course of modern science that might have come about had we discovered them earlier? But the drawings had still more secrets to reveal. Secrets that would lie hidden to the naked eye. Royal palaces house not only priceless treasures and centuries of history, but also the royals themselves. Keeping the palaces safe and secure is of paramount importance. In 1982, Michael Fagin's intrusion into the Queen's bedroom revealed the cracks in Buckingham Palace's defences. Twenty years later, they would be tested again. But this time, the intrusion would go unnoticed. In 2003, Daily Mirror journalist Ryan Parry decided to put royal security to the test. Could he get into Buckingham Palace by applying for a job there? The application process was surprisingly straightforward. Parry gave the pub where he'd grown up in Wales as a reference. And when the palace phoned, the barmaid apparently on the phone yells out to the pub, does anyone know this Ryan Parry bloke? And a regular who's sitting at the bar said, ooh, I know him, I know that Ryan Parry. Oh, I know him, he's a good bloke. And on that basis, the personnel of the royal household employed him. Ryan Parry started work as a royal footman. To expose the access he had, a covert Daily Mirror photographer was positioned to snap him. These images showed he was at the heart of the royal household, with no proper security checks. He was shown riding on a state coach, and even stepping out onto the famous Buckingham Palace balcony. I just had to kind of, you know, kick myself and think, I can't believe I'm actually standing at, at this very spot. The distinctive uniform was his past. Once he'd got the uniform, there seemed to be a trust. He used his access to all areas, to nose around the whole palace. He even served the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh their breakfast, and he took photographs. It was the most extraordinary scene. They had their cornflakes and cereals in Tupperware boxes. We imagine, perhaps, that the Queen eats off silver salvers on a daily basis, but actually she doesn't. She eats just like the rest of us. Parry's unlimited access to the palace even coincided with a presidential visit by George W. Bush. There is no state visit more important or frankly more crawling with security than an American president visit to the Queen of the United Kingdom. And Parry had all of the details of the visit. 
It was shocking that he could get a job that easily with so little security checks and clearance. He could have been someone who was looking to kidnap and hold ransom for financial gain, a senior member of the royal family, or even for whatever means, perform an assassination on a senior member of the royal family. And just as the president was settling into his suite at the palace, amid some of the tightest security in palace gates. He'd finished his duties at 11pm, folded up his uniform, packed his bags and just walked out. The next day, the Mirror published his story. 15 pages of detailed insights into life at Buckingham Palace. My brief was particularly to look at the security um, procedures in place. But a lot of what you wrote, obviously, was more kind of below stairs tittle tattle, wasn't it? Sure. I mean, that was all part of my information gathering. The Palace were furious because, of course, Ryan Parry was undiscovered. They only knew about it when they saw the front page the following day. This wasn't just a breach of security. They'd had an intruder who had taken photographs of their, their space, their private life. The Mirror claimed the undercover operation exposed lapses in security rather than in invading royal privacy. You have to look at how those flaws are exposed and how, in fact, you, you make sure you deal with them so that shouldn't be allowed to happen again. An inquiry into the incident led to vetting procedure being introduced to ensure the palace is kept watertight. But for those tasked with keeping the royal palaces secure, the challenges remain. Palaces and castles are not prisons. You don't have ACAC guns, you don't have huge amounts of barbed wire. And the royals themselves do not want the intrusion. So you have to balance that their homes with security and it's not an easy job. Still to come on Secrets of the Royal Palaces, we reveal Windsor Castle's invisible Leonardo da Vinci drawings. It's an incredibly rare privilege to be able to see them in the flesh. They're not normally able to be on display. And we glimpse inside Sandringham's most private of rooms, where one Thomas Crapper spared the blushes of the prince's mistresses. They would have had to have put up with gross, handsy Edward, but they could have at least lushed away their own detritus. The royal palaces are home not only to the royal family, but to some of the most important artworks on the planet. All of this stuff is the Queen's, but it's also the country's. The royal collection looks after all of this priceless furniture, all of these priceless paintings on behalf of the nation. Amongst the collection is this rarely seen set of some 600 drawings by Leonardo da Vinci. Acquired by King Charles II over 350 years ago, they're still revealing their secrets today. One of the things that would have really appealed to Charles II as both a collector and someone with quite a scientifically inclined mind was Leonardo's mirror writing. Many of the drawings are covered in a strange, so it only reads properly from right to left if you hold it up in front of a mirror. I'm not entirely sure why he did it. One argument is that he was left-handed and so by writing across the page he wouldn't be smudging his own ink as he went. To me it really looks like it's coded so perhaps he used mirror writing in order to protect his ideas from people that might wanted to steal them. But these weren't the only secrets the collection was concealing. Among Leonardo's most beautiful sketches are pieces of paper that seem like they are completely Blank. Over the centuries, the drawings had faded. But under UV light, they are revealed. These scans show some colour that has faded away, the sketch lines that we didn't know existed. There's one particular image of a horse that we didn't know da Vinci had done because it faded so badly, no one could see it until it was scanned. Over five years after they were drawn, these treasures of the royal collection are still disclosing new information. There is an intimacy, an immediacy, a modernity about them that looks to me like they could have been drawn just yesterday or today. The drawings he created are extraordinary. There's nothing else like them. The royal palaces and the artworks they contain celebrate the 
nation's history. But there are some moments in the past that the royals would rather forget. Buckingham Palace hosts over 50,000 visitors a year, and everything must be just so. But during the reign of Queen Victoria, the usually fragrant air was fouled by the Great Stink. A visitor to Buckingham Palace in the 19th century would have come near to fainting from the smell. It was disgusting. It was awful. And that was because the sewers, they were completely overloaded. So they leaked and they leaked human waste all over the floor, particularly all over the floor of the kitchens. Yes, very, very hygienic. And so there's Victoria, the most powerful woman in the world, and she is living in a palace full of leaked human waste. It's completely disgusting. But it's not just Buckingham Palace that's the smelliest, perhaps least hygienic palace in the world. The whole of London is really very bad smelling. And that was literally because the sewage system wasn't up to it. And people at the time said that the Thames was actually black. And all this reached her head. And Queen Victoria herself, well, she sold it on. But there was one day in which she and Albert had to go out on the Thames for a royal visit to see this steam that was really one of the sights of London at the time. And Victoria was ready. She was a prepared kind of queen. She had this handkerchief covered in perfume to put to her nose so she wouldn't smell it. But even, she said, after two minutes, she couldn't cope. So she had to say to the boat, go back to Buckingham Palace. She really felt she was about to faint. She said to her daughter, Vicky, that she'd been half poisoned by the smell of the Thames. The royals might have hoped this was the end of their toilet troubles. But 13 years after the Great Stink, they faced a new sanitation issue. This time, the problem wasn't at Buckingham Palace, but at Sandringham. Queen Victoria bought the Sandringham estate for her 21-year-old son, Edward, in the hopes that it would offer a calmer, healthier lifestyle. But at this idyllic country residence, a deadly threat lay undetected, and the heir to the throne was left fighting for his life. In 1871, Edward, the Prince of Wales, got really sick uh, with typhoid fever and it created a huge national moment of emergency. The press reported daily Edward's battle for survival. Tensions were raised because his father, Prince Albert, had died of typhoid only 10 years earlier. The great inquest was undertaken about where he might have got uh, typhoid from. And so the issue of how to create a clean, safe, sanitary environment was something taken with the utmost seriousness. As part of the investigation into how the prince might have got typhoid, it was thought that contaminated water at San Diego might have been the cause. The solution was for a 60-foot high tower. It had on the top of it a 32,000 gallon iron tank, which contained the water from a new spring which had been drilled. And all that fresh water then would be enough to power the taps and the toilets down in the house, but was also strong enough for four fire hoses to be sprayed over the roof of the place. Seven years after Edward survived typhoid, the Appleton Water Tower was completed. Built in a Byzantine brick style, it sits on the highest point of the Sandringham Estate. There's an extra benefit to that because a royal viewing gallery was set underneath the tank, which gave sweeping views across North Norfolk. They must have had their fingers crossed that the tank held over the royal family and works were carried on inside the building too. For the palace loose, Edward brought in the best. Thomas Crapper's name, a sanitation engineer. He went from toilets being bog standard to creating a new standard for bogs. He's not the inventor of the flushing loo, but he's one of the men who patents it and makes money from it. He was given a royal warrant for the work that he did at Sandringham. He created all of the sanitation for this new house, including 30 cedar seated toilets and uh, there were things of great beauty for edward such pretty porcelain was certainly an added attraction he was well known for keeping a string of pampered mistresses so for his mistresses that are allowed to come to sandring i mean they weren't all but certainly lily langtree did and we know that in the latter years alice keppel came to sandring they would have enjoyed a flushing loo they would have had to have put up with gross hansy edward 
they could have at least flushed away their own detritus. So there is always an advantage to being the lover of royalty. Throughout history, the British royal palaces have withstood wars, floods and fires. But in 2020, the world faced an unprecedented threat. As the deadly coronavirus pandemic took hold, palace officials scrambled to protect the Queen. It's probably more important that the Queen is isolated than anybody else. The government depends upon her. So were she to succumb to the pandemic, it would be... An extra crisis. Then, aged 93, the Queen and Prince Philip, almost 99, were considered at extreme risk. Four days before the rest of the country officially locked down, the Queen left the capital and was whisked away to Windsor Castle. Having a castle like Windsor Castle to lock down in is almost ideal. It's built as a fortress. But even Windsor Castle would need an extra line of defence against this new enemy. So the Royal Household set up something known as HMS. Consists of a team of 22 loyal staff members who supported the Queen and the Duke through lockdown. Like everybody, the Queen has had to make sacrifices during lockdown and she's managed to pare her staff down to just the basic 22. You know, a couple of chefs, an army of gardeners, a valet or two, some housemaids, housekeepers. I don't think she'll be making her own dinner quite yet, but it's definitely a stripped down version of the huge amount of staff and quarters she normally has. Before entering Windsor for their three-week shift, every member of staff would have to undergo a week's quarantine and COVID testing. You're dealing with an invisible enemy. With the virus, it only has to come in in that secure bubble that you've created. Getting it wrong is not an option. Despite the strict new measures, spirits in Windsor remained high. Prince Philip was particularly amused by the use of the phrase bubble because in the 50s and 60s, he was referred to in some quarters as the big bubble, which was, of course, Cockney rhyming slang, bubble and squeak for Greek. So the first number is 5 and 8, 58. But even with palace doors firmly shut, the world was allowed a rare glimpse inside Windsor and the other royal homes. I'm very glad to have been able to join you today. One of the big revelations of lockdown has been being able to see into everyone's homes on the phone to Boris Johnson during one of her weekly audiences using the old-fashioned 1970s telephone surrounded by corgi ornaments. Every surface that is flat in their homes is covered in clutter. Now these are homes of people who never do their own dusting. She may not do her own dusting, but the Queen and her team have successfully managed to keep her palace COVID-free. Coming up on C of the royal palaces. Prince Philip's controversial plans for Sandringham cause a royal family feud. The Queen Mother, she was horrified that a house that she loved might be threatened with demolition. And we reveal the strict protocol surrounding the royal tartan. It is the most exclusive fabric that anyone could wear in the world. Sandringham. This traditional country house is much loved by the royal family and by one senior royal in particular. Sandringham Estate is really uh, the kingdom of Prince Philip. It was given to Prince Philip by the Queen after her accession and the fact that he's retired there really shows that it's there that he feels most at home. But the old house hasn't always enjoyed universal acclaim. If you look at the critiques of Sandringham, it's never held up as a fine piece 
and it's all a bit of art in the place with the exception of some tapestries. Philip had his sights set on a rather radical makeover. It might surprise us to think of the Duke of Edinburgh suggesting that Sandringham should be demolished. But once upon a time, he did that in 1960. If Sandringham needed to be swept with a new broom, the Duke of Edinburgh was the man to wield it. Philip carved out this role as a bit of a moderniser. Now, that's not how we'd see him today, but give the guy a break. He's in his hundred year. Prince Philip proposed that it should be pulled down and the dusty old rooms might be replaced with something altogether more modern and befitting of a 20th century monarchy. He looked to an architect called David Roberts, who used a brick modernism, large windows and open planning to create new types of space and lots of light. Amidst an atmosphere of post-war optimism, the Queen was sympathetic to Philip's modern ideas. But then the Duke came up against a formidable opponent. The Queen Mother hadn't really bought into that whole picture and she was horrified that a house that she loved might be threatened with demolition. Queen Elizabeth faced a dilemma. Back her beloved Philip or put family and tradition first. This isn't just a royal residence. It's somewhere that the Queen is hugely emotionally invested in. Her grandfather and her father adored Sandra. Ultimately, the Queen Mum got her way. The Queen rejected Philip's plans and the nation was spared the 1960s concrete palace. So Sandringham stayed the way that it always had been and consequently Sandringham has hardly evolved since. The interiors are still largely as they were in the 19th century. The sitting room is kind of full of knickknacks. says there's the feeling that Queen Alexandra or Queen Mary have sort of just left the room. So not necessarily every taste, some might say a bit over the top, but actually very, very intimate and warm and cosy. Sandringham isn't the only much-loved private royal home. Balmoral is set amongst the locks and mountains of the Scottish Highlands. Its beauty inspired one royal to turn fashion designer. At Balmoral, the royal family loved to embrace the Highland life when it comes to their attire. The family take their Scottishness very seriously and they wear tartan a lot when they're in Scotland. For centuries, tartan has been worn by Highlanders as a symbol of clan identity. Each clan in Scotland has its own tartan. It represents the family, the lineage, the history of that particular clan. When Victoria and Albert bought back they were keen to look the part. But as a non-Scot, Albert had no tartan. So he decided to design his own. The Balmoral tartan that was designed by Prince Albert. And it's grey and red and black. It's quite distinctive. The mottled grey background of the Balmoral tartan is supposed to represent the granite that can be found locally around Balmoral. It was slightly amended by Edward VIII now the version we have today is similar but slightly softer in tone. But what makes the Balmoral tartan so unique is its exclusivity. The use of the fabric has for many years been strictly controlled. The Queen is the person who has to decide if anyone else is allowed to wear it, so even those in the royal family have to get her permission. But there are a few chosen non-royals who are permitted to wear the tartan. Bagpipe players on the Balmoral estate and also the Queen's personal piper are the only non-royals who are allowed to wear this tartan. So, unless you're on first name terms with the Queen, you're going to have to take up the pipes and move to Balmoral if you want a chance to wear this unique royal tartan. It is the most exclusive fabric that anyone could wear in the world. Next time, at Highgrove, Prince Charles turns his country residence into Fort Knox. If you ever go to Highgrove, you won't see the security. It's invisible. At Kensington Palace, a queen held captive. The Kensington system becomes a Game of Thrones, a battle of wills between the Duchess and Conroy on one side and Victoria on the other. And at Sandringham, a witness from Prince Philip's crash reveals what really happened. The driver couldn't move. It was quite obvious it was Prince Philip. <laughs> <laughs>